Neil Beveridge is senior analyst for oil and gas at Sanford Bernstein. I bet you don't like being called a veteran, do you? Uh, <laughs> Neil, okay, tell us what shale gas is and you know, the, how hard it is actually to get out of the ground. Well, shale gas is really the new frontier of the oil and gas industry. You know, shale gas is contained in thick organic mudstones that are buried at three to four kilometers within the ground. And the problem to date has been getting this gas out of these rocks. And it's really technology which has opened up this resource through basically fracturing or exploding these rocks. It's enabled oil and gas companies to effectively produce from these formations at flow rates which are commercial. And that's opened up an enormous quantity of new gas reserves. Many people are concerned about the environmental impact, not just of, of shale gas, but also oil sands too. Yes. I mean, I think there's a number of concerns around shale gas, potentially around disruption to water quality. You know, overall, we feel that a lot of these resources are so deep within the ground that they're unlikely really to cause uh, a serious contamination uh, problem. You know, I think with oil sands, you know, clearly uh, there are also issues. You know, the EU has moved to potentially ban oil sands on the grounds of CO2 emissions. Uh, but remember, you know, China is anxious to secure energy supplies and there's 70 billion barrels of oil sands in Canada. It's almost as much oil as in Saudi Arabia. For, so for China, this is a big resource that they probably can't ignore. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is they are trying to shore up their energy needs, not for the next five years, but perhaps for the next 50 years, would you go along with that? And this is why the Canadian Prime Minister is there, I guess, to also uh, cement some of these ties. Yes, no, exactly. You know, Canada could be enormously important for Canada. They not only have, you know, enormous oil sands reserves, but also have very significant gas reserves and in British Columbia. Yes, no, so I think the plan will be around really two projects. One will be around the export of LNG from British Columbia uh, to China. And, you know, of course, we've seen the PetroChina Shell deal. You know, we've seen the Sinovac Daylight deal. So clearly companies are positioning now for the major development of gas in British Columbia, which could lead to LNG into China. But I'm sure they'll also be having a look at what they can do around oil and potentially oil exports to China as well. Okay, but, you know, what does this all mean when it comes to prices? I think what it means in terms of prices is that uh, for LNG, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot more supply uh, options available in the international markets. And longer term, you know, this could put pressure uh, on uh, LNG prices over the long term. You know, I think for oil, uh, you know, clearly with oil at $115 a barrel, you know, it clearly shows that we need more supplies onto the uh, global market. And I think that's why uh, there's going to be a lot of interest to see uh, if we can develop new oil sands projects in, China, in, in Canada. Well, well, you know, have we seen any sort of substitution of oil for LNG? That's one part of my question. And, you know, is there enough LNG out there at the moment? Because there's all this coming on stream that you almost begin to think that maybe mm -hmm. there'll be too much in a few years' time. Yeah, no, I think that, that, you know, this is an important issue. I mean, certainly in the U.S., people have looked at whether or not you can replace gasoline or diesel uh, with LNG. You know, you've heard of the Pickens plan. You know, he's a very strong advocate of replacing oil uh, with gas as a transportation fuel. In China, we're starting to see, I think, more evidence that the Chinese are looking very seriously at this, uh, this technology. We're starting to see LNG potentially being used for trucking. And in central China, compressed natural gas is being used, you know, for buses, taxis. So gas is increasingly being used as a substitute for oil. All right. Well, you know, of course, it has the same sort of uh, geopolitical uh, tensions which play out with prices like this because a lot of it comes from Qatar as well and uh, from other parts of the Gulf, but they have to go through the Straits of Hormuz. Now, yes. well, how are the tensions there affecting gas prices and LNG in particular? Well, so far, we haven't seen uh, a tremendous impact on global gas prices from the tensions uh, there. I mean, a lot of the Asian uh, gas prices, of course, linked to oil. So if oil moves up, you know, Asian long-term contract prices will also move up with that. But what's important is if we did see any disruption to the Straits of Hormuz, it's important to remember 35% of the world's LNG comes from Qatar, and that passes right through the Straits of Hormuz uh, every day. So markets such as Japan, uh, the UK would be severely disrupted, you know, if we saw any a, uh, a reduction in supplies through that key shipping lane. Neil, always a pleasure having you on the program. And Neil Beveridge there from Mass FSC Bernstein.